Hi, everybody. Welcome to the course, Theology of the Civil Rights Movement. This course is a journey through some of the outstanding works by luminaries in the civil rights movement, uh, both before it became the national phenomenon that it did, um, and in much more recent times, uh, to look at how it has affected contemporary conversations about racial justice in the United States. Today, we're starting with the work of Howard Thurman. We put up our slide. Howard Thurman was a really influential figure early on in the movement, uh, especially in relation to the work of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, so we're going to look at Howard Thurman's book, Jesus and the Disinherited, and try and trace how he is certainly a, a, a theologian in a certain way. A theologian is a person who develops theories about God. Um, so theos means God. Logos means the, the study of or the, the principle of something. Uh, but he also had a very unique take on the religion of Jesus, as he calls it. So look out for that as we move through our slides. Howard Thurman was born in 1899 and died in 1981. I say here he was a spiritual inspiration to the civil rights movement. He was not a person who was active in the marches, in the events, I mean, he took part in some of them, but he was more like a figure who came just before that movement reached its period of greatest activity, uh, and helped to define the work that was undertaken there. Thurman himself uh, was influenced much by Mohandas Gandhi uh, in the 1930s, uh, and actually met with Gandhi in, uh, the, in India on, on a trip, and he carried this philosophy of nonviolence from Gandhi to the United States. Now, Gandhi, you'll know, was responsible for uh, or the, the independence of India from British colonial rule, is attributed to the work of Mohandas Gandhi. Mohandas is his uh, first name. Um, Mahatma Gandhi may be what you've heard him referred to as. Uh, Mahatma it means Maha Atman, the great soul. Uh, so it's an honorific title. His, his given name is Mohandas. Um, Gandhi's example, uh, and Gandhi in turn was influenced by another figure you may have heard of, Henry David Thoreau, his essay, Civil Disobedience. Uh, but Gandhi's example uh, set the stage first for Thurman to develop his version of nonviolent resistance, and then for King to really, we can say, operationalize that and bring that to fruition uh, in the portion of the movement that he led. Thurman co-founded in San Francisco in the 1940s uh, an organization, the Church for the Fellowship of All Peoples. Now, this was called a church, and it was to a some extent Christian. Um, however, uh, it welcomed persons of all faiths, and crucially for our purposes, persons of all racial identities and backgrounds. It was a church that realized the vision that Thurman wished to see realized on a national scale. The important term that we are introducing from the top here is this notion of the religion of Jesus. Howard Thurman was often critical of Christianity. The Christian churches had not done well, specifically in addressing the crisis of racial justice in the United States in the mid-20th century, and you'll see Thurman write really powerfully about that in this book. What Thurman was interested to do is to go back to what he believed was the religion, the actual practice of Jesus of Nazareth, of the person who actually lived and taught and died in what is now Israel uh, in that first century. Uh, so that contrast is going to be important for understanding what he's doing. As I've said, this book, which was published in 1949, directly lay the groundwork for the civil rights movement. And within five years, um, that took shape uh, with the work of Dr. King. Uh, King himself uh, often carried a copy of this book with him. He, he said at one point it converted him to the philosophy of nonviolence. King had encountered this elsewhere. People were certainly talking about it as an option, but it was in reading Thurman that he was really motivated and compelled to pursue this as, as his own approach. The question that Thurman asks in this book um, that I've drawn out of the text and I present here for your consideration is this. Why is it that Christianity seems impotent to deal radically, and therefore effectively, with the issues of discrimination and injustice on the basis of race, religion, and national origin? 
He's asking this question in 1949, at the time, at a time when, as is often said, uh, Sunday morning was the most segregated hour in the United States. There was the white church and the black church, uh, and there were divisions among Christians who certainly uh, teach and uphold uh, the equality of all. What Thurman wanted to know is why that is so and why the church is impotent, does not have the power, the potency, to address this pressing issue. What does he say in response to this? Christians, he says, are often speaking about the needy, the ignorant, or quote-unquote backwards peoples. That's a term that's often used in the Indian context. Uh, it sounds kind of old-fashioned in ours. Um, there is a lurking danger, however, in this. A Christian will feel that she is a giver of charity, right? is providing something for the needy, the ignorant, or the, so to speak, backward. Um, the problem is, Thurman says, it is exceedingly difficult, this is him, to hold oneself free from a certain contempt for those whose predicament makes moral appeal for defense and succor. So the sucker there is like support, right? So when you are constantly seeing yourself to be in the position of caregiver, of provider, of supporter, it's easy to fall into a mentality where you place yourself above the person you are helping, despite your best efforts, right? Um, what Thurman wants to do is to consider not what Christianity says to those who are privileged, who have power and position in society, but what Christianity, what the religion of Jesus says to those who are the disinherited. We can look at this crucial passage from his book. The masses of men, he says, live with their backs constantly against the wall. They are the poor, the disinherited, the dispossessed. What does our religion, the religion of Jesus, say to them? The issue is not what it counsels them to do for others whose need may be greater, but what religion offers to meet their own needs. The religion of Jesus, holds Thurman, is not simply a provider of charity to the needy, to the leper and the widow and the orphan. It is that. It is also a means of empowerment for those who are dispossessed, disinherited, right, to secure justice. Think about those words disinherited, dispossessed, right? Dis suggests that at some point you had an inheritance, that you had possessions. You have been stripped of these. They have been taken from you, right? You live now with your back constantly against the wall. What does this image say to us? It is the image of a firing squad. It is the image of someone who is caged, as it were, trapped, has nowhere to go, surrounded on all sides. My back is against the wall, right? This is an image of someone who is being given no options by their society. What Thurman wants to ask is what does Christianity say to that person about what they should do in their situation, not just to help others? The approach he takes is to look at the figure of Jesus himself. We've already seen this term, the religion of Jesus. He gives an interpretation, he says, of Jesus as a religious subject rather than a religious object, right? Um, if I say, Mary hits the ball, right? Mary is the subject of that sentence. She is doing the action. The ball is the object. That is the thing that she is acting upon, right? So if we look at Jesus as an object, we are looking at Jesus as if as, as it were, he's the ball, he's the object, he's something that we are focused on that is outside of ourselves, right? And we do certain things for Jesus. If we are looking at Jesus as a subject, as a religious subject, then we are asking, what was it like to be Jesus? Who was Jesus? What did it, you know, what drove him as in the subject position of the sentence, Mary, right? The one hitting the ball, the one taking the action. Um, there are three things that Thurman highlights about Jesus's situation in his real existing life. Number one, Jesus was a Jew. 
He was an embodiment of the ideals of the Jewish people. He was born into a certain community, a certain ethnic group, a certain religious community, right? Uh, and this community had a certain standing in what was at that time Roman society, right? Roman, the Roman military was occupying the territory uh, where Jesus grew up. It was part of the Roman Empire, and Jesus was a member of this community. He was a poor Jew, disinherited even within his own society. Okay, so already the Romans are above the Jews, right? Because the Jews are an occupied people, the Romans are the occupier. But Jesus, even within the Jewish community, is a poor Jew. He is not a wealthy, educated, you know, high priest. He is a person who, even within a society that is already subjugated, is subjugated due for econ to economic reasons. Um, and filling this out, he was a member of a minority group in the midst of a larger dominant and controlling group that is the Roman Empire. So in a triple way, Jesus was himself disinherited, right? That which was his by rights, we would call this today human rights, had been taken from him. He as a subject, as a person acting, had to contend with these realities. A passage from Thurman for us to consider. Jesus' message focused on the urgency of a radical change in the inner attitude of the people. He recognized fully that out of the heart are the issues of life, and that no external force, however great and overwhelming, can at long last destroy a people if it does not first win the victory of the spirit against them. To revile because one has been reviled, this is the real evil, because it is the evil of the soul itself. Jesus saw this with almighty clarity. If someone is trying to subjugate me, and they are able to break my spirit, right? They are able to make me hate and revile them. They are able to control my reactions and manipulate me, right? They have won. If, however, I refuse to be manipulated by them, if I am not broken in my spirit and I have the strength of the soul itself, then nothing this external force can do, however great and overwhelming, can at long last destroy a people. Right? So this crucial idea, our course, Theology of the Civil Rights Movement, what is at the core of this theology? A conviction that the heart, what you experience and believe and hold within yourself, is the source of your strength, not force of arms and not violence. We will see this developed fully in the work of Martin Luther King, whom we see depicted here um, on the slide. Thurman continues, <clears throat> what he's trying to do here is work out what options Jesus had. So he's a Jew, he's a poor Jew, he's a member of a subjugated minority group. That's his position as subject, right? What's he going to do? Well, what Thurman does is he follows a logical process. He says, well, what options are available to Jesus, right, in Nazareth? under the Roman occupation. He could resist or he could not resist. That's what we start with. Jesus could have just been a carpenter, hangs out, takes it, says, hey, you know what? Maybe I'll go to heaven when I die. It's all good, right? He could have chosen to not resist. And if he did not resist, second bullet point here, he could either imitate the Romans or reduce contact with them. If he imitated the Romans, he would try and become like a Roman, right? get educated in the Roman way, get some kind of social position within Roman society. If he reduces contact, he withdraws into a separate group, a kind of enclave, uh, as isolated from the fact of Roman occupation as could be managed. That's if he did not resist. Third bullet point, if he did resist, right, if he takes that, that red pill to resist, um, the physical overexpression of an inner attitude. That's what resistance means. The physical overexpression of an inner attitude. Um, he could either choose armed resistance or nonviolent resistance, right? Uh, and what Thurman says is, okay, he's, he's worked through this little chart. Um, Jesus chose, chooses nonviolent resistance, a resistance of the heart, rather than trying to organize a military force to overthrow the Roman occupations. Jesus chose this, King chose that response, 
Thurman is also counseling this response as an expression of the religion of Jesus. Remember, we're taking Jesus as a subject of his actions. Why did Jesus choose this course? Let's look at another passage from the text. Jesus recognized with authentic realism that anyone who permits another to determine the quality of his inner life gives into the hands of the other the keys to his destiny. If you determine my inner life, you are in charge of me. If a man knows precisely what he can do to you and what epithet he can hurl against you in order to make you lose your temper, your equilibrium, then he can always keep you under subjugation. It is a man's reaction to things that determines their ability to exercise power over him, there being the people who have that power. This becomes the word and work of redemption for all the downcast people in every generation, in every age. Do not let your opponent, your oppressor, the person with power, control the inner life, the quality of your inner life. Once you do, once you let them make once you let them uh, make you hate them, once you let them make you hate them, then they are making you do whatever they want. Right? This is the crucial point in Thurman, is by, by refusing that kind of inner control, you have the only possible option in the view of Thurman uh, and of King later um, to effectively break the external control. <clears throat> it's, it's valuable to note, um, just emphasizing this point about the religion of Jesus and, uh, and so forth, that I think today when we look back at this period in the 1940s or 50s, we think, well, every, everybody was religious then, you know, Christianity was, was everywhere. Um, this is not the case. Uh, people were virtually as skeptical of Christianity, not quite in the same numbers as today, um, but a very widespread way, um, as many are today. Uh, we have a passage uh, giving evidence of this in Thurman, um, talking about the American church. I belong to a generation, he says, in 1949, that finds very little that is meaningful or intelligent in the teachings of the church concerning Jesus Christ. It is a generation largely in revolt because of the general impression that Christianity is essentially an otherworldly religion, taking as its motto, take all the world, but give me Jesus. The desperate opposition to Christianity in 1949 rests in the fact that it seems to be a betrayal of the Negro into the hands of his enemies by focusing his attention upon heaven, forgiveness, love, and the like. Okay, so you are living in a condition of manifest and extensive racial injustice. Your life is determined and, and compelled by these unjust forces outside of yourself. What do you do? Do you resist? Do you not resist, right? The impression that people had of Christianity at this time, according to Thurman, the people he's referring to, is that the church actually made you not resist. Right? The church withdrew you and said, oh, maybe, maybe I'll go to heaven, right? I'll be with Jesus. Take all the world, but give me Jesus, right? You, injustice can be everywhere, so long as I go to heaven. Uh, and this is why Thurman is so critical of Christianity and holds this alternative forth of the religion of Jesus. The middle chapters of the books, we have the, the first chapter called The Religion of Jesus, which we're reading, um, and then we're reading the chapters Hatred and Love. Um, there are actually three middle chapters of the book. Hatred is the third of those. Um, the first is fear, and the second is deception, and the third is, is hatred. These are traditionally known, not just by Thurman, but, but previous to him, as the hounds of hell, the, the three-headed dog, the three -headed dog uh, that guards the gate of hell. Um, what is it um, that brings these things together? All of these things, Thurman maintains, poison your inner life. These are things done by the disinherited, by people who are suffering injustice. They are afraid of their oppressor. They lie and deceive their oppressor as a survival strategy, and they hate their oppressor. Um, all three of these things, Thurman thinks, are as it were, perfectly natural responses to oppression. Also, they are three things that will maintain you in oppression. Uh, the point of the book is to liberate you from these three things because they are leading you to only one place, and that is to hell, not to liberation and freedom. I want to comment briefly on hatred, and then we'll talk about love. So we won't talk about the first two of these so-called hounds of hell, fear and deception. 
Thurman writes, hatred cannot be defined. He wants to give instead what he calls a diagram of hatred, right? Um, one part of it is that hatred involves contact with no fellowship. With greatest contact might come the least real fellowship. So let's say you're living in a very um, uh, society with very great income inequality, and you are living right alongside people with great you know, wealth, <laughs> and you f you're constantly made aware of that difference, but you have no personal relationship with those people. That is a recipe for hatred, says Thurman. Second, unsympathetic understanding without healing and reinforcement of personality. So you understand something about this other person that is a candidate for your hatred, but it's not sympathetic understanding. You don't try to understand why. You don't try to see what brought that person to that place or to understand, or, or to even if they're wrong, to, to sympathize with them in order to help them get out of that misapprehension. Um, the third, active ill will, which spreads like a contagion. We're building here in a way, we're building. And finally, dramatized in a human, human being, this ill will becomes hatred. So you're aware of each other, but there's no fellowship. You understand the situation, but there's no sympathy exchanged between the two of you. This turns into ill will, and that ill will turns into hatred. So what Thurman is doing is almost in a medical way, tracing the emergence of hatred, how it grows, like he says, a contagion. He continues, and here we have an image, a Google image of a, a medical diagram of hatred. <laughs> what does hatred look like in the facial muscles? Kind of a curious inclusion. Sustained resentment, Thurman writes, is bottled up until it distills an essence of vitality, giving to the individual in whom this is happening a radical and fundamental basis for self-realization. Let's look at that carefully. And the next point too, this provides a tremendous source of dynamic energy and the whole personality is altered. There's a new quality of endurance, right? When you are overcome by hate, your muscles tense, you become stronger, you become uh, immune to fatigue, you'll press on, right? Because you're driven by that hatred. Um, this is a radical and fundamental basis for self-realization. Hate feels good because you're right <laughs> and the other people are wrong and they're evil or they're accessories to evil, right? So hatred is a very tempting thing because you're in a position uh, 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 you, you are a disinherited member of society. You are unjustly oppressed. And those people did it to you, right? So in a moment where your dignity and identity are being taken away from you, stripped from you, disinherited from you, right? You find a sense of purpose in hating them. Thurman is giving, in my mind, a very realistic portrayal of the dynamics of hatred. Hatred is not just a naughty thing we do. Hatred is powerful. Hatred is alluring and tempting. It helps us to feel that we are realizing ourselves. But Thurman will go on to say that this is not the case. <clears throat> hatred, he says here on the second point, seems to serve a creative purpose in all the ways already described. By disciplined hatred, Thurman says, an individual seeks to protect himself against moral disintegration, which is he is being threatened with from all sides. He does to other human beings what he could not ordinarily do to them without losing his self-respect, right? So in a climate of hatred, that kind of social diagram that we follow, the steps down into hatred, this is the result, a society divided in this way. Here's, here's Thurman's however. However, Hatred destroys finally the core of the life of the hater. It guarantees a final isolation from one's fellows. And Jesus, he continues, saw that hatred meant death to the mind, death to the spirit, death to communion with his father, the one that he called God, right? Or Abba, Daddy. Uh, so hatred is alluring. It makes us feel powerful. It makes us feel strong. And then, like the emperor in Star Wars, right, it eventually cripples you. It breaks you. It means death to the mind, the spirit, and to communion with God, which in Christianity represents the source of one's being, right? So there is something false about hatred. 
it is a false promise. Uh, and though it seems to lead to progress, it in fact only leads to death. The alternative, um, counseled by Thurman, is love. Uh, this is what we see in the last chapter of the book and in the last chapter we have assigned. As he writes, the religion of Jesus makes the love ethic central. And that's from earlier in the book, in the first chapter. But the um, important term there is the love ethic, right? There's, in this religion of Jesus, there is an ethic. There is a way of conducting yourself that helps you to not fall victim to fear and to deception and to hatred, those great hounds of hell that tempt you and that seem to offer a way forward, but are false. Uh, there is a twofold demand placed on Jesus, um, Thurman points out. He is uh, demanded, he is called morally to love those of the household of Israel, but also to call the, uh, to love those who are beyond the household of Israel. So the love ethic practiced by Jesus is not only to love people who are like him, either socially or culturally or racially or nationally or whatever. Um, it is to go beyond his community, the household of Israel, the Jewish community, to love those who are even reviled uh, by uh, members of his community. That includes the Samaritans. Uh, the Samaritans were a group hated by the Jews of Jesus' time for having intermarried with other non-Jewish peoples. They were seen as traitors. And the Romans, who were the occupying military force. Uh, we will not go in detail here into the story of the Good Samaritan um, for sake of time. However, if you're not familiar with that story, I'd encourage you to look it up. Um, the story is of uh, an answer to the question, who is my neighbor? Uh, as I put up on the slide, and Jesus tells a story of a man who helps someone who has fallen victim to robbers on the roadside. Uh, and the man who helps this victim, who is Jewish, is a Samaritan. Right? So Jesus is showing how across communities where there is hatred, love can actually be practiced. This is what is called the love ethic. Uh, as Thurman talks about in discussing enemies, there are different kinds of enemies. There are personal enemies, traitors, and external enemies, right? So a personal enemy is someone who has done something wrong to you. Right? And a traitor is someone who has violated trust within your community. And an external uh, enemy will be someone who is threatening your community from the outside. Uh, Jesus calls for you to love your enemy, right? Love your neighbor, but more, love your enemy. This is a very radical thing in this love ethic. Love of the enemy, Thurman writes, means that a fundamental attack must first be made on the enemy status. For lack of a better term, an unscrambling process is required. The difference in status needs to be broken down and not merely transcended. Difference in status is you are my enemy, right? You have done me wrong. And so long as that person appears to you as an enemy, so long as you are regarding that person primarily as someone who has done wrong to you, then you and that person will not be able to love one another. You will not be able to enter into um, this, this or practice together this love ethic. Um, and society will fall into fear and deception and, and hatred, as Thurman uh, rightly, in my view, believed it to have done in his time in the United States. What does this mean, practically speaking? We've been talking about religion and, and, and other kind of more abstract concerns. Let's get back to the situation 1949 in the United States. Thurman writes, for the Negro, it means, this love ethic, that he must see the individual white man in the context of a common humanity. The fact that a particular individual is white and therefore may be regarded in some overall sense as the racial enemy must be faced and opportunity must be provided, found, or created for freeing such an individual from his white necessity. Let's, uh, let's pause on that. Freeing that individual from his white necessity. Uh, we will have occasion later in the course to read the work of James Baldwin, and he will touch on this in his book that we'll read from him, The Fire, next time. The, uh, what Baldwin points out is, is helpful here, and I'm certainly confident that he would have read Thurman on this. Um, 
And freeing such an individual from his white necessity is freeing that person from the illusion that he or she is white, someone else is black, right? And that white means that, that you as a white person are superior. Uh, this is plainly false. Uh, and so to believe that is a falsehood. And to believe that leads you to, into actions that promote fear and deception and hatred, and actions that promote unjust domination and fragment society, because it is a false belief. Uh, so what Thurman is saying is, in order to love your enemy, you have to find a way, the Negro community here, to use that term he uses, needs to find a way to, through the practice of love, through breaking down, unscrambling this enemy status, wake up the white population of the country to the reality that their belief that they are white and therefore superior is a false belief and is tearing the country apart. And friends, that is what we have for you. All right, that's what I have for you. Um, I think this is such a powerful book. I hope you read it with great attention. I hope that you are able to and that we're able to have a good conversation about it on perusal. Um, the practice of this love ethic is what is realized in the work of Dr. King and others that we will read. Um, and I hope you're able to devote some reflection to Thurman's claims, uh, which are often surprising. He's not simply making very standard Christian claims about loving others. Um, his notion of the religion of Jesus and some of the other specific concepts that we've seen from him are much more radical and I would dare say interesting than that. So uh, read it keenly and I look forward to our uh, point of contact next week. Thank you.